Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Myro and today we're gonna tackle with another large and substantial discography of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, uh, Australian rock band formed in 1983 by singer, songwriter Nick Cave, multi-instrumentalist Mick Harvey and guitarist Blixa Bargeld. I decided to go with Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds because I've been a fan for a very long time. I uh, seen the live a couple of times but I actually haven't heard all of the records and that's the main reason I decided to uh, do this deep dive because I haven't heard all the records especially the 80s stuff and I was kind of curious to hear uh, that early period of uh, of the band since I know it's been it's actually kind of different from their sound they found in the 90s and today so and also I've been looking at YouTube and I haven't seen that many uh, rankings uh, ranking videos and Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds only some top 10s top 10 records top 5 records but not you know a proper ranking or a proper deep dive of all the records and uh, the band released so far so yeah it's gonna be interesting and it was interesting for me especially the stuff I haven't heard uh, before uh, they released so far 17 studio albums and uh, there are a couple other side projects as well like Grinderman 1 and 2 but I'm not gonna count those two records I'm gonna only count the 17 studio albums by the band so so let's get this started at number 17 I have a record that many people have last or uh, near the bottom and I can definitely see and hear why because I haven't heard this record in full before doing this deep dive and when I heard it I was disappointed. Uh, that, wa that is Nocturama from 2003. Uh, it was their 12th studio album and um, yeah it is really long. First of all it's almost an hour long and um, it is really boring and uninspired. It's not terrible, but it is, you know, when uh, when I heard the first song, the opening track, Wonderful Life, I was kind of, yeah, this actually is actually pretty good, and I was expecting another, you know, No More Shall We Part record, but uh, as soon as that song is finished, which had nice groove to it, it uh, the rhythm section was really good, as soon as that song is finished, uh, you get nothing interesting anymore on the record. The Maybe the most interesting thing after this song is the closing track, Babe, I'm on Fire. But to be honest, that song is almost 15 minutes long and it's basically repeating the chorus over and over again for 15 minutes, which is way, way too much. It is a rocking track, yes, but it should be only 3 to 4 minutes, not 15 minutes. Because there is no change in progression, there is no new elements added to the song, it's only just the chorus repeating over and over and over. Uh, a lot of these tracks are not memorable at all. So, yeah, overall, I think it is a really disappointing record. Even the lyrics, something I really love about the band, and especially Nick's lyrics, are, I think, I think they're, he's a great lyricist. But this album, I didn't feel that. It, it's really kind of forced and uninspired, uh, the lyrics even, not just the music. So this is the reason I have it last, and I have it at... 2.5 stars. At number 16 I have Kicking Against the Pricks from 1986 which is their third studio album and uh, the reason I have it this low is simple because it's a cover album and I usually don't care about cover records unless that cover album is Brian Ferry's These Foolish Things which is great. Uh, anyway I digress. Uh, this album is a uh, you know, classic cover album. Uh, there are some songs that are good, some uh, that are not as good, like um, uh, their cover of All Tomorrow's Parties and Hey Joe, I feel, are not as good. And since, you know, these songs kind of lost their charm here. Uh, but anyway, I do think this album is an import important part in the discography uh, just because it kind of... Um, you know they changed their sound a bit here not a bit a lot here on this record uh, and even Nick himself stated a couple of times that uh, this album feels important to him because you know he said that he improved his arrangement skills and sense of melody on this record and that's something that they used and he used on subsequent albums and we can definitely hear that uh, change even 
on the next album that came after Kicking Against the Pricks and they, it's an important stepping stone for the development of their sound but anyway I think it's a fine you know cover album but not nothing much and that's the reason I have it this low and I have it at three stars at number 15 I have maybe a controversial pick for some because I saw a bunch of lists online that have this album way 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 higher than me and even number one uh, and that is their debut record from 1984 from her to eternity and um, on paper I should really love this album because I love Swans and this is a no way record but uh, it just didn't click with me uh, unlike for example Swans and uh, their debut record which came uh, in 1983 Filth which is uh, brooding, menacing, engaging, interesting and in some way really groovy this one is not like that it is to me I only heard one song prior to this deep dive from this record and that's the title track obviously which I heard live a couple of times and uh, I don't know I expected maybe too much of this record because of filth but unfortunately I was kind of disappointed uh, I think this album is kind of boring and as is the case with almost all new no wave uh, records it is really hard to listen to and it's definitely not for everyone especially if you uh, knew Nick Cave by you know from his songs uh, from the Boatman's Call era uh, and you expect to hear another Boatman's Call or what have you will be shocked to hear this debut record and uh, there are some kind of, there are a couple of interesting songs uh, like the title track which I think is great and uh, Saint Huck is also an interesting song with some great lyrics and uh, interestingly enough it opens up with uh, Leonard Cohen's Avalanche uh, which barely sounds like the original it feels like a deconstructed version of the original and it's really menacing and unsettling and the lyrics here are also menacing and unsettling and this is something about Nick Cave that I really love his lyricism he, and it's really dark take uh, and uh, on some of the themes and subjects and did, to me that is maybe the, the driving force of this record in general and uh, I, I just don't find it interesting enough I mean I like No Wave but not all of it uh, and uh, this album just doesn't do it for me and uh, the best is yet to come from the band so this is a solid start sto solid uh, debut record and um, I have this one also at three stars at number 14 I have their latest studio album from 2019 Ghostine and uh, it is maybe a controversial pick for some I don't know I know that people like this a lot I mean I don't hate it as well I think it's a pretty solid album but uh, it is not as good as some of the other stuff that came uh, before that record uh, this album uh, as is the one prior to it Skeleton Tree are really personal to Nick since they're both dealing uh, in a sense with the tragic tragic passing of his son Arthur and uh, Nick himself said that this album is his way to reach out to his son and you can you know sense that feeling uh, throughout the record and if you can judge the book by its covers then yes you can say that for this record since you you kind of get a sense of how this album is gonna sound just by looking at that cover artwork which is serene and beautiful at the same time and the album itself is it is that it is serene it is beautiful it is it sounds gorgeous it is more hopeful than its predecessor skeleton tree there's more surreal ambience to it as well but that's my biggest problem with it as well it is it's too much of the same thing and I get that but it's way too long and um, some of the songs here are also way too long over 10 minutes long but it, doing the same thing over and over again there is no variety on the record and that is my biggest biggest problem with this record and it could be trimmed down a bit and it could be better that's for sure but uh, for what it is I cannot give it more than 
3.5 stars. At number 13, I have their uh, 14th studio album, Dig Lazarus Dig, from 2008. And this was the last album to feature the founding member, Mick Harvey, as well. And uh, the title track kicks off this album and sets the overall vibe of the record. And uh, it is a great, fun, rocking track. And uh, we can hear throughout the influence of... Uh, from Nick's Grinderman side project here as well, which is some more, you know, garage rock uh, type of sound on that project. And that album came in 2007, so only a year prior to this one. So you can hear the influence from the Grinderman here, and uh, especially on the title track or the song We Call Upon the Author as well. But also there is variety here as well. Uh, we uh, like on tracks Today's Lesson, Moonland, and there is a, even a spoken word track, Night of the Locust Eaters, which is a really atmospheric track and kind of reminiscing of the old Nick Cave days as well. Uh, there are a couple of more uh, up-tempo songs here like Lie Down Here and uh, Be My Girl, uh, and my favorite track from this record, Midnight Man. The way how this album is structured, kind of feels like uh, Henry's Dream, which is uh, their 1992 record. Uh, and um, But um, there's nothing groundbreaking here, in my opinion. It is just pretty solid overall from start to finish, but nothing that, you know, will make me, you know, amazed, unlike, you know, some of the other records that they released it, uh, during this time. So... I have this one at 3.5 stars. At number 12, I have by far my most controversial pick so far, and I think the biggest contro controversy of this ranking is my ranking of the beloved album from 1997, The Boatman's Call. And... Uh, I don't know, it is widely considered and like one of his best albums, if not the best, And but it just doesn't do it for me, unfortunately. It is good, but I cannot give it more than 3.5 stars, and i tell you why exactly. This album is pure emotion, raw emotion, and the lyrics are Nick's expression of things that happened to him uh, during that time, mostly love problems, and couple of tracks here are a product of Nick's relationship with PJ Harvey and uh, yes it is a beautiful record piano driven subdued in nature but my biggest problem with it it is too samey and there is no variety whatsoever and I like when Nick and the band do different things on the record the lyrics here are dealing with romance and romantic pessimism of sorts and it's pretty straightforward so it is a good breakup record, if nothing. There are some great tracks here, like Into My Arms, People Ain't uh, No Good, and Black Hair. And I'm fine with a sappy bell piano ballad from time to time, but uh, not the whole album like that. And that's why I have it this low. And I prefer more morbid and darker Nick Cave. What can I say? So, 3.5 stars. At number 11, I have their record from 1990, uh, which is The Good Son. And uh, th this album is a departure from the dark and menacing records that they released. And this one is more lighter and has more uplifting sound as well. And this is the product of Nick being in Brazil, uh, happily in love with Brazilian journalist Vivian Carneiro. And uh, apparently that whole ordeal uh, kind of made him um, do this kind of record. And f as, as you can see in the cover artwork as well, it is kind of, you know, you get the sense of what this album is. And, and as Nick said himself, uh, uh, that rehab that he did and his venture into Brazil kind of purged much of the despair and darkness that you you know was kind of a part of the band in the early 80s especially in the albums that came uh, prior to The Good Son and uh, 
like I said, this album is much more softer and gentler, and we have some great ballads and songs like the Ship Song, uh, the Weeping Song, and Lucy. And uh, in return, we get the more accessible uh, uh, record for and a solid entry point for anyone who wants to dive into Nick, Nick Cave's discography. Uh, the instrumentation and lyrics here are more romantic in nature. There's no more ominous lyrics here. Uh, which I actually like and that's my <laughs> biggest problem with this record I mean I know it's fine everybody has their own taste but uh, I prefer the mor morbid and dark stuff from the Nick Kim and, and the band especially in lyrics and uh, I think this album is pretty good and enjoyable uh, it opens up uh, with uh, Foina Cruz which is a song based upon a traditional Brazilian Protestant hymn which is an interesting, uh, w really interesting song for them. Uh, they haven't done that before. Uh, like I said, uh, this album is completely different from the sound we got used to uh, from the band. And yes, it, it, in a way, it is an important record as well on uh, in their catalog. Uh, but uh, unfortunately. I have to place it somewhere and I like I said I prefer Darker Nick Cave and uh, this is the reason I have this one at number 11 and I also have it at 3.5 stars. And now we're gonna kick it off with top 10. M number 10 it is Your Funeral My Trial from 1986. This is their fourth overall studio album and this is more obviously a uh, post-punk Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds record. It is more melodic than the predecessors and as they mentioned this album kind of gave them a template to go forward with. Uh, all of the band members here were really pleased uh, with how good this album came to be and I can see that definitely. Um, the al they already hinted a more you know a different direction on kicking against the pricks. They just evolved and developed that sound. Uh, on this record and we can hear a more diverse instrumentation, uh, more straightforward song structure. The lyrics here are also saw, slight some uh, saw uh, slight change in direction as well. It is, they are more poetic uh, than before and as we can hear especially on the opening track, uh, Sad Waters. And uh, I have to mention my favorite song on this record. Uh, which is the Carney uh, eight minute long song about I don't know uh, this is a song that it is definitely a not an easy listen but it is to me I really like it it is really engaging and uh, it never gets boring it is the storytelling here is immaculate and it keeps you you know uh, hooked throughout the lyrics are dark and uh, grim and are telling a story uh, of a carnival worker who disappeared who vanished and soon as the caravan was prepared to leave two dwarves Moses and Noah found uh, find uh, Carney's horse sorrow barely alive skin and bone and they decided to you know end his life uh, uh, and kill it to end his suffering they bury the horse but you know kind of shallow and uh, soon after heavy rain starts to fall and we get this dark and grim image in the end of Sorrow's corpse floating uh, on the water and it's really uh, you know when I first heard it I, it scared the shit out of me to be honest and it, it is really unsettling and captivating at the same time and that's the main reason I love Nick Nick's lyrics and they're really brutal and, and uh, dark um, and this album you know continues that tradition from the first two uh, then we go to the, tr the title track which is uh, a nice haunting piece with some great lyrics as well and maybe the most interesting song here on the record is stranger than kindness and after that I kind of start to lose uh, um, this album start to lose me after stranger than kindness but there is still some intensity on the songs like Jack's Shadow and Hard On For Love but the last two songs here are not my favorite uh, that is She Fell Away and Long Time Man they're not that memorable and I think that album needed a more uh, stronger second half for me to give it higher score and uh, 
they kind of redeemed them themselves on the CD version of this album when they added Scum as the closing track, which is a great song. And so I'm kind of an offense here. Uh, I had this album at high 3.5 stars, but more I listen to it, the more I feel it deserves to be a four. So yeah, I have to give it four stars for uh, Your Funeral, My Trial. Great record. At number nine, I have an album that I believe is maybe the most underrated Nick Cave's record, and that is their second studio album from 1985, The Firstborn is Dead. And uh, uh, the album's name is actually a reference to Jesse Garen Presley, the stillborn identical twin of Elvis Presley. So that's interesting. And uh, to be honest, this album grew on me a lot in this last month or so. I haven't heard it before, I only knew one song from this record and that is the opening track, Tupelo, which is an amazing song and maybe my favorite song from this early period of the band. It is wild, it is unhinged and catchy at the same time. And uh, uh, I can definitely see this album being higher on my list, uh, you know, on subsequent listens and because I really do enjoy it. It is of perfect length, it is only 40 minutes long, seven songs. And I think it's a really good step up a step in the right direction after the debut from her to eternity this album feels more accessible it is bluesy but still retaining the darkness of the debut but the songs here are more focused and more cohesive than on the on the previous record uh, we also have here a cover of wanted man which is a song composed by Bob Dylan and Johnny Cash. Nick even was granted permission to alter the lyrics of the song and I think he did a great job there. Uh, I do also really like uh, how hysterical sounding is uh, the song Black Crow King. And uh, even on this record you can hear the glimpses of what they will become uh, later. And uh, I think that this record definitely deserves more attention and I think it's very underrated. I know a bunch of people have it, you know, on the bottom half of the list, but I definitely can, you know, can see this album being even higher on my list and I really, really do enjoy it. And I have it at four stars. At number eight, I have their 1992 record, Henry's Dream. And, uh, uh, the Good Sound kind of predicted what would become of the band in the 90s. It is, this album is much more focused, much more cohesive and elegant. Uh, and there are, of course, much more love songs as well. And compared to The Good Sound, which was mostly piano-based, uh, this one is focused more on acoustic guitar. It is more rocking album in a way as well. It opens up uh, with Papa Won't Leave You, Henry, an intense, energetic track, and kind of that track that sets the mood for the rest of the record beautifully. Uh, there is also a nice variety of songs here. Uh, like I mentioned previously on Dig Lazarus Dig, uh, which is kind of a similar structure in a way, this album is uh, contains more up-tempo inten intense songs like The Opener and Brother My Cup Is Empty, but there are also some ballads as well like Straight To You and Loom Of The Land, the, the lyrics are great and interesting, especially on songs like John Finn's Wife, and which may be my favorite song on the record. And uh, speaking of variety, we have a great closing track, uh, Jack the Ripper, uh, which incorporates those primal drumming uh, from the early uh, days of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. It's really bombast song and great closer and a great song. Uh, also, I'm a sucker for good organ and naturally I love Christina the Astonishing, a song that features uh, Hammond organ. And when I look at it, this album is really, you know, solid from start to finish. It's really uh, uh, cohesive and uh, it, there are no weak tracks here. Everything works. The flow is good. And... Uh, Overall, a really satisfying listen, and uh, I have this one at high four, four stars. At number seven, I have their 2016 album, Skeleton Tree, and uh, this album oozes pure, raw emotions. It's dark, it is menacing, heart-wrenching, and devastating at the same time. Uh, 
it was an album written a year after Nick Cave's song tragically lost his life and you can feel his pain in these songs and if anything sets the tone of the record that's the opener Jesus Alone with its droning electronic noises and it, this song makes you entranced and uh, this album is you know throughout it is really minimalistic uh, there is sparse instrumentation here and there mostly synths some violin and piano and droning background soundscapes throughout definitely not an album i can listen to every day to be honest even though i really do love it i have to be in a specific mood uh, for you know for me to be able to listen to it from start to finish uh, it is really devastating and soul crushing experience especially on song i need you which may be his most emotional performance ever in my opinion it is really just you know just listen to that song and you know it kind of you know squeezes you squeezes your chest when you listen to it it's really devastating and uh, uh, really heavy song uh, Warren Ellis uh, a long time uh, collaborated with Nick uh, is the star of the show here and his influence is felt throughout the record some of the other great tracks here are Girl in Amber Magneto and Distant Sky if you want to fully experience this album you have to kind of focus and listen to it in peace and truly feel the raw, emo raw emotions of the songs it is a fantastic fantastic album this late in their career and i highly recommend uh, for anyone to listen to it if you're in the mood for it as you know it is not for everyone definitely and it's not an easy listen and uh, but anyway i I have to recommend it because it's an amazing record and I have it at high four stars. At number six, I have their 2001 record, No More Shall We Part. And this album was released four years after The Boatman's Call. And at that time, that was the longest gap between two Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds records. And uh, uh, this album may sound like its predecessor, The Boatman's Call but I still think the instrumentation here is more varied and more interesting in my opinion and as we can definitely hear from the start with the magnificent opening track and one of my favorite Nick Cave and the Bad, Seed, uh, Bad Seeds songs uh, as I said sadly by her side and um, this album showcases uh, uh, how good the band actually is uh, the to me, this album is like a better version of uh, The Boatman's Call. The instrumentation is more energetic and varied and gorgeous. There are some gorgeous arrangements and lyrics. Lyrics which are less obscure than usual and more straightforward. And, uh, you know, Nick, even Nick sings here uh, with a wider vocal range, hitting the higher notes as well. And uh, there are also some tracks here that I really love, like uh, 15 P Feet of Pure White Snow, an amazing song, which is a more energetic uh, track, something that I missed on the Boatman's Call. And But my biggest problem with this album and some of the al other albums from this period is the length. It could be trimmed a bit and... Uh, and I think that in that case, the album will f would feel more compact and, uh, and more, you know, a better listening experience since uh, this album is almost 70 minutes long, which is way too much. Uh, and there are like 12 songs on it and most of them are, uh, you know, at least four minutes, but most of them are six, seven minutes long. I think they could trim down a bit and made a better record, but still, and I have it at high four stars. At number five, I have their 1996 album, Murder Ballads. Amazing lyricism on this album. I really enjoy the stories and it's a really fun record overall. Uh, here we have some guest vocal support from PJ Harvey, Kylie Minogue, and even Shane McGovern from The Pogues. And uh, the most famous song here on the record was definitely and is definitely Where the Wild Roses Grow and with Do It with Kylie Minogue. And if that's the only song you heard prior to listening to this record, well, you'll be surprised because the rest of the songs here are completely different. And that song got 
wide attention and it was played on MTV and on radio stations all over the place and I remember seeing a interview with Nick uh, on YouTube uh, and he was talking about this record and how uh, that song alone uh, you know got the attention of mainstream media and uh, how many people bought the record and they were kind of go what the hell is this they expected something different based on that single but the album is you know not like that it is completely different and as the title suggests the album consists of new and traditional murder ballads a genre of songs that deal with crime and murder uh, Staggerly and Henry Lee are both covers of traditional songs with Nick changing and altering the lyrics a bit and I do believe there are great versions especially Henry Lee it's a duet with PJ Harvey and I think it you know the chemistry between them is amazing I really love that song and in one of the interviews Nick stated that he wrote two songs much earlier but he couldn't find a place to fit them on any previous records until murder ballads and those songs are the opening tracks songs of jo song of joy and O'Malley's bar the closing track actually not the closing the second to last track the longest song on the record which is uh, i believe 14 minutes and something long and uh, also we have the closing track is that is not the end which is a cover of bob dylan's song and i do think it is a fitting closer to the record and kind of a great way to end this story. Uh, this whole album is atmospheric and in some cases even terrifying, like on the opening track Song of Joy for example. I think that both PJ Harvey and Kylie Minogue were excellent, an excellent choice for the two songs they appear on. It is a nice contrast between their voices and Nick's. And uh, my biggest problem with this record is again the length and uh, kind of lack of variety here but you know what the stories and the atmosphere uh, kind of make make me want to listen to it again and again my favorite track on the record uh, is super fun and unhinged song the curse of Millhaven, a story of a teenage murderer and and i just love that song i mean and the lyrics are you know uh, amazing and fun at the same time and uh, i know this album uh, on miley's bar as well amazing lyrics and it's really funny song in, as well all in all i do believe this album is great very strong and interesting from start to finish and i have to give it 4.5 stars great stuff two thousand years later at number four and as you can see i got a haircut in the meantime so this took me a while at number four i have abattoir blues or and however you want to call it the liar of orpheus i'm a sucker for a good double record and this one fits the criteria in my book and this album came only a year after the dreaded nocturama and it's mind-blowing to me that they put out a record this good only a year after that flunker of a record which was nocturama and a double record two hours long and it's amazing listening experience from start to finish uh, the album is split in two as suggested by the title we have a more rocking first album uh, abattoir blues and a more mellow uh, album the liar of orpheus and let me tell you they're both consistent and really good especially i prefer especially the liar of orpheus and uh, they could easily release this as two separate albums but i think this is much better i like the variety on it and it's it's actually feels inspired and ambitious project by a band by the band and i think they nailed it i have to mention that this is the first album to feature uh actually not to feature blixa Bergeld, who was there from the beginning when the band was created and uh, Over to Our Blues kicks off with an energ energetic gospel rocker Get Ready For Love and it sets the tone of that part of the album perfectly it's loud, it's dynamic and very mature the use of choir uh, is done marvelously here 
and it adds, adds so much to the songs, makes them more layered and interesting. The lyrics are also, once again, great, more mature in a way and passionate as well. Uh, some of the songs here that I really love are There She Goes, My Beautiful World, Fable of the Brown Ape, Breathless, Supernaturally, and of course the most famous song of this album and a beautiful closer, uh, Oh Children, which is of course on the second part of the, the album, The Lyre of Orpheus. And what can I say about its length? Well, I think I won't cut, cut a single track here. And I don't mind that it's almost two hours long. I, I like every song here. I, I think that everything works here. It is varied, it is interesting, it is inspired, it's ambitious. And I don't know, I would give this even five stars, but it's not there yet, maybe in the future. But for now, I'm sticking with high 4.5 stars. At number three, I have my favorite 80s output by the band and definitely one of the most consistent records they released up to that point. And that is, of course, the, the one that I haven't mentioned already, uh, Tender Prey from 1988. And interestingly enough, Nick Cave wasn't pleased with this record. He wasn't pleased with the production and playing overall. I mean, the production works, in my opinion, I think, uh, uh, especially how the vocals were produced. Uh, it kind of adds to the overall at dark at atmosphere of the this album. And even though they had problems during the recording of this record, I think they wrote some great songs here. And that is obviously apparent on the f from the first couple of seconds of the album when the Mercy Seats a seat kicks in. It's one of the uh, signature songs by the band and they've been playing this live constantly ever since it was released. The lyrics are great and it is the song itself is really you know chaotic, menacing and devastating at the same time. Uh, a banger in my opinion. There are a nice variety of songs as well. We have uh, more rocking songs uh, like uh, Diana, City of Refuge, and uh, there is also a song like uh, second song on the album, Up Jump the Devil, which is really interesting song uh, about. Uh, it is quite melodramatic as well. It's about an un, uh, unlawful man who claims to be followed by the devil, who drags him to hell. In the end, it's a really interesting song and really nice lyrics as well. Uh, then we have more somber gorgeous tracks like Watching Alice and the closing track New Morning which kind of foreshadows what's to come on the next album uh, The Good Sun and uh, one of my favorite tracks here is definitely Sunday Slave that's a really captivating and mysterious track the album is dark the arrangements are really good and effective and Nick's vocals are emotional and believable great stuff and really consistent records and I have it at high 4.5 stars and uh, we have two more albums to go and uh, you may be surprised that I have this album this high on my list but what can I say this album really grew on me over the years I've been listening to it since it was released in 2013 I remember buying the CD and I have it still and it really clicked with me I was maybe in a special mood for it but uh, I don't know I like every song on this album. It is a slow burner. It is a simple record uh, with, you know, sparse percussion. Uh, it is way different than previous one or even Abature Blues. There's simple, simple instrumentation. It's subdued and melancholic. And I like that. Uh, this album contains one of my favorite Nick Cave songs and that is uh, Jubilee Street, uh, a highlight from the record it is a song that grabs your attention immediately it is simple but it gradually builds and builds and builds until it explodes towards the end uh, the live performances of this song are amazing and uh, I had an opportunity to hear that live and I was stunned how good it was really great song uh, Warren Ellis also had a strong influence on this record uh, some nice soundscapes that make the atmosphere really shine here, especially on the closing track, um, the title track, Push the Sky Away. It is hauntingly beautiful and touching song and, in my opinion, a perfect way to close this album. As I said, it's a slow burner and it takes time to get used to the album, but once you do, 
it is really rewarding it is a lovely gentle masterpiece this late in their careers i mean it is really amazing that they managed to put uh this kind of record uh this late in their career i mean it is great uh, we have other songs here that i really like like the opening track we know who you are uh hicks boston blues as well uh one of the longer tracks on the uh, the album the bass here is really good as well played by martin casey uh, it is really prominent throughout the record and it really makes the songs stand out more uh, people tend to compare this album to the boatman's call but i don't see the connection uh, this album is really different and much more explorative than the boatman's call and this is why i have it this high i do believe it's a great record i really enjoy listening to listen to it from start to finish and um, yeah great stuff and i don't have it at five stars though i have it at high 4.5 and my number one nick cave and the bad seeds record my favorite record by them and the only record i have uh, at five stars it is let love in from 1994 this is the, their most uh, consistent and a perfect record from start to finish uh, it contains everything that I love about Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. It is dark, it is lovely, it is passionate, it is melodramatic and scary at points as well. And of course, great lyricism throughout. The album is feels like a culmination of everything that the band did up to that point. And uh, I think they nail it. Uh, every song here is great. It opens up with... Uh, do you love me and it closes with do you love me part two and i really like when bands do that it kind of works especially for this album uh, my favorite track here of course is maybe the, his most well-known track red right hand uh, a bizarre and stupendous track and i really like the usage of bell on it i think it's great it really adds to the overall atmosphere of the, this song in particular and loverman as well uses that same bell uh, and it really grabs you and uh, it really you know makes you want to fully do a deep dive of uh, on the lyrics as well especially on some of the songs like red right hand which uh, the song which was prominently used on peaky blinders and most of you maybe already heard it before uh, besides red right hand we have songs like uh, uh over dimension lover man nobody's baby now thirsty dog all great tracks the arrangements here are once again amazing uh, i like the menacing organ that they've been using here twangy guitars and nick's amazing vocal performance throughout you can clearly hear the band's passion on this project i really love it and uh, uh, i know people <laughs> tend to hate for example jangling jack uh, but I find that song really interesting and fun to listen to and for me it works in concept of this record and like I said I love every second of it I think it's their crowning jewel and an amazing record and I have it of course as I said at five stars so this would be my rankings of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds and I know it may be controversial some of my picks at least but uh, this is how I feel about uh, the records and uh, thank you again for watching and please do leave comments down below what are your favorite Nick Cave ranking, uh, albums and uh, post your rankings and you know all of that good stuff and uh, we'll see you in the next one.